You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. They're repenting and returning to Him and rejecting that lifestyle. The renewing of their relationship will enable them to see that they've been worshiping silver and gold for what is it, what it is, and they reject it. But there are others who are still worshiping it and they're going to have to be dealt with, which also takes place. It's a complex problem of human sinfulness and the need for God to, to make anything change because you notice God's the one that has to initiate the change. We can't do it. The Holy Spirit has to do it before we even recognize we got a problem. Today, Pastor Ken will be reminding you that all the Old Testament blessings pointed to God's Son, the Messiah, whom He would send as Israel's Savior, the ultimate demonstration of God's goodness and kindness. Even though Israel rejected the Messiah and crucified Him, God continued to give them every opportunity to be saved, pouring out His grace and delaying His judgment. It's not fear of judgment or punishment that leads people to repent of their sins and be saved, but the goodness of God. Well. Let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Isaiah, chapter 31, as he continues his message, Does God Really Intervene? He's saying they're starting to reach the point where there's no return. They haven't gotten there yet, but we're no longer back in the first six chapters of Isaiah where he says, come, let us reason together. Though you're sin well, we're not there anymore. We're, we've moved to judgments coming. They're going to be punished for what they've been doing, but there's still an opportunity for them to be saved. Judah will be humbled. It's going to happen. There's still time to repent. But the warnings that Moses gave in Deuteronomy chapter 7, chapter 11, and chapter 28, and there's several others too, are going to become a reality in the life of the nation. And if they don't repent, the final reality, which is they're going to be taken out of the land and put into exile, will become real. And by the way, that did happen 150 years later when Babylon came in and took, took them away. But this is reflected in what comes next, verses 6 and 7 of chapter 31. Return to him from whom you have deeply defected, O sons of Israel. For in that day, every man will cast away his silver idols and his gold idols, which your sinful hands have made for you as a sin. Okay, now with this term in that day, we're suddenly taken from 705 B.C. and now we're thrown into something that's still in our future as well. We're thrown into the last days. This is a picture of dealing with the Assyrians then, and now it's being as blended with a picture of the Assyrian, because Isaiah has already said the Assyrian is the same as the Antichrist. So now he's talking about that. And we know this because he says, he's not talking about Judah. Notice he says, O sons of Israel. Now it's the whole nation. It's not just Judah. He's now expanded to all of Israel. He's talking to all of Israel, and he's giving them a picture of ongoing spiritual warfare. And this is a picture that's actually going to be expanded later by Paul. Now, they have decided to play with the darkness. They've gone to Egypt, and they're consorting with the world. For us, when we give our lives to Christ, we leave the darkness, and we sign up with the light. In fact, uh, the process of being baptized is a declaration to the world that we've changed loyalties. We now are loyal to Jesus. We're identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. But we're also telling the, uh, the evil enemy, the, the unseen realm, that we don't belong to you anymore. We belong to Jesus. Any anybody who turns away and turns back, that's defection. You're going back to the other side. We don't belong to that anymore. Neither did Judah. For us, in, and Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now notice he's using military terms just like we're dealing with here in Isaiah. Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. What's going on in Judah? Well, they've listened to the lie of the devil to, that, that says, you can get help from Egypt. Egypt didn't show up, but they're listening to the lie of the devil. 
This is not something they thought of. They're listening to the wrong voices. The defection of Judah has already come up once before. We saw that back in chapter 1, verse 2. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, sons I've reared and brought up, but they've revolted against me. That's defection. Rebel, revolt, a rebellion. They've turned away from God. So he's saying to turn back to him as a nation rather than continue the revolution. And they've revolted very deeply. In fact, in the Hebrew, the word means to make deep their revolting. They've, the spirit of the revolts have now deepened into their hearts. And it's, it's reached the point now where it's, it's basically becoming part of their lifestyle, rebellion is. It, is. Is there any future for them? That's the question. The betrayal that Isaiah is referencing here is the betrayal of not looking to Yahweh for protection, but looking to the world instead. That's betrayal. As we've already covered, it's not the first time this has happened. It's not going to be the last time it happens. The last time, though, it does come up when Jesus talks about it in Matthew 23. It also comes up here in verse 6. There's a point in time yet to come that Israel will realize what they've done and the betrayal they subjected Yahweh to, and they will all return to him as one. But they'll all do it individually, but do it at the same time. Zechariah talks about it. He says, then I will bring the remaining third, and this is how many who survive the tribulation, those who live in Israel at the end of the tribulation, only a third will still be around. He says, I will bring the remaining third into the fire. I'll refine them like silver is refined, and will test them like gold is tested. They'll call on my name, and I will answer. I'll say, these are my people, and they'll say, the Lord is my God. The way Isaiah has constructed all of this points to the return being sought by the Lord. He's looking at that, but it won't happen until that day, because that's, that's what he says. Isaiah clearly means that this will fully happen, just as we see in Zechariah 13, on the day that the remnant realizes that without Messiah, they're doomed. Seeking assistance from the world doesn't work, never works, never has worked, never will work. John tells us, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. That's where Judah is. They're in the world. They're seeking ideas from the world. They're seeking salvation from the world. There's no salvation there. The comparison determines that Isaiah here means the day of the Lord. This is not some future time uh, within five years, ten years. He's saying this is at the end of the age. And, and he's basically saying you do need to be ready because there's going to be another crisis and another crisis and another crisis until you get to the final crisis and you wind up having to turn to Yahweh, finally to Messiah. And the God that they've been rejecting for all that length of time, they'll finally accept completely and totally. Judah needs to repent now. Not next time. There's another crisis. Because if you've studied the Bible any thing at all through First and Second Kings or, or, or just what we've been going through here, how many crises are there uh, taking place in is Israel in any given year? I mean, it, some of the crises, it makes it sound like we're reading today's newspaper. Uh, you know, they have just as many of them going on as we do. They had problems with politicians lying. They had problems with politicians uh, making promises that they weren't going to keep. They had problems with Crops, they had problems with disease, they had problems with armies floating around out there, they had problems with other folks that wanted to take them down as a nation. Do we have those problems? Yeah. God's saying, trust me. They didn't. He's telling, telling us to do the same thing. Don't wait till the next crisis. We need to turn to him now. The Bible says now is the day of salvation. There's a reason for that. There might not be a tomorrow. The time to reject idols is now. Those who wait for that day, and they're going to be exposed, the idols will be exposed for what they are as no gods. In fact, the word in the Hebrew for idol actually means a non-entity, a no god. Uh, the word is Eli. It means insignificant, vain. These idols are people's works of their own hands. They're, they're worthless, they're ineffective, and... You know, there's going to be a repentance by the remnant at the end of the age, but it's not going to be until the end of the age. 
So as in chapter 30, we see these idols being discussed at the end of the age, being overlaid with silver and gold. Well, we see them again here in chapter 31, overlaid with silver and gold. Same thing. It implies that the gods being worshipped are not so much actual statues anymore, but the god of cash, the god of money, the god of dinero, um, or mammon as the Bible calls it. It's the world system is what they're talking about. The world system of the beast is going to be based on only those who worship the beast are going to be able to buy and sell. And they are the only ones that have the mark there. The only ones that have cash, they're the only ones who can do that. And they're going to be able to economically enjoy all the benefits uh, of living in the, under the, the uh, world of the beast. But of course, that means they've accepted the mark of the beast, they fully identify with him, and they worship the dragon. As it says in Revelation 13, 3 and 4, um, they worship the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? But when Messiah returns, that whole entire economic system being built, and we see some of it coming into place today, it'll collapse. The entire system of worship with it, gone. The gods of silver and gold, out the door. As the remnant repents, they reestablish the relationship with Yahweh, and they're repenting and returning to Him and rejecting that lifestyle. The renewing of their relationship will enable them to see that they've been worshiping silver and gold for what, is it, what it is, and they reject it. But there are others who are still worshiping it, and they're going to have to be dealt with, which also takes place. It's a complex problem of human sinfulness and the need for God to, to make anything change, because you notice God's the one that has to initiate the change. We can't do it. The Holy Spirit has to do it before we even recognize we got a problem. It'll happen shortly in the history of Judah when Isaiah is talking about this. It's like 18 months away that the Assyrian army is going to be torched finally. God's people are going to look to him in the face of overwhelming odds. And unlike the problem Isaiah sees in the present day, they're going to respond inappropriately. We've already talked about that. They're going to say, let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But in the future, the response will be appropriate. There will be repentance. The whole of the nation will come back to the Lord as one. And the Lord will not disappoint them. Because when they do that, here's what's going to happen. It's in Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself, and he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name in which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were, follow, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Stop and imagine. Everything's bad. Everything's getting worse. It's like the Assyrian army here in about 18 months for Isaiah. And then they turn to the Lord. And when the nation turns to the Lord, the next thing they see is heaven's opening and here comes Jesus on a horse. And the, my first thought would be, what took us so long? Why did we wait to this point when we're almost destroyed? So verses 8 and 9. Um, and the Assyrian will fall by a sword, not of man. Well, in the future, we know that. Jesus in chapter 19 is going to take care of that. And a sword not of man will devour him, so he will not escape the sword. And his young men will become forced laborers. His rock will pass away because of panic, and his princes will be terrified at the standard, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. So how will the Assyrian fall at the end of the age? A lot like the way the Assyrian army is going to go down in about a year and a half. The weapon systems of man have nothing to do with either one of these problems. It was not mice eating all their bows, in their, as Herodotus liked to say. 2 Kings 19, verses 32 to 35 says this, Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way he came will be the same he will return, and he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant. And that night... The angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. 
And when people arose early in the next morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. There's the army. They're all camping, and you see the smoke, and you hear the weapons being rustled. The next morning, they're all dead. It's a type of destruction which will fall on the Assyrian at the end of the age. And I always wonder whether or not the plague that the Lord says in Zechariah 14 that he's going to visit on the army at the end of the age is the same plague that he gave to the Assyrian army, killing 185,000. In verse 12 of Zechariah 14, it says, This will be the nature of the plague which the Lord will strike all the nations that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will decay while they stand on their feet, their eyes will rot away in their sockets, and their tongues will dissolve in their mouths. Now, imagine waking up in the morning and finding the guy, other guy in the tent with you looking like that. I, I don't know what it was. There's a lot of guess and a lot of conjecture. We just know that God took care of the problem. There's, there's, we don't know. We also know that everything that is going to be left by those armies that are destroyed at the end of the age, Judah picks up and takes, just like they did to Assyria. Now, remember the contrast earlier in the chapter? The Egyptians are men and not God. They can't help you. God's a spirit, not man, and the weapons of his warfare are not the ones we would consider. <laughs> Paul discussed this, too. We're human. We don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. As believers, we have, a, we have all kinds of weapons available to us, but as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, they're very different. And they're, they're, we have to rely on him because it's spiritual warfare. God's showing Judah what's about to happen to his spiritual warfare. The enemy, yeah, it's the Assyrians, but there's somebody else who's behind the Assyrians. There's an unseen realm that's, kind of in for, that, that's pushing their way into you. Well, it's going to happen again at the end of the age with the beast, and we know who's behind the beast, the dragon, and all of the unseen realm again. As believers, we have access to all of the weapons necessary that, to engage in spiritual warfare when we get attacked, just as the nation did. Now, Judah thought they had a solution. They had a physical army coming to them, and they sought out another world power to help them. Yahweh, though, is letting his people know that what many times we see outwardly as a physically-based war actually has spiritual-based roots. We saw that in World War II. We saw that in World War I. We've seen that in numerous battles taking place around the planet even today. The army and those in it are listening to a fallen divine being who lies to them and tells them they are supermen. And the Germans thought they were supermen. They weren't. Supermen. They are not, and God's people do not need to engage the services of another group of unbelievers to defend them from unbelievers. We need to use the weapons that the Lord has provided to us, and all we have to do is just seek Him and, and, and pray. We don't need to do the same thing they did. In 1 John 4.4, 4, little children, you're from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Do we remember that? That says that. Or Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Do you believe that? God says we can. Sometimes I feel like I can't do anything. But God can do everything. And he says, I am I'm more than a conqueror because of what he is. In Romans chapter 8, Paul spends a lot of time talking about this. He says, we know that for those who love God, that is those who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good doesn't mean I'm happy about it, but all things work together for good. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that the son might be firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. So what can we say about all this? If God's for us, who can be against us? That's a rhetorical question. If God's for you, nobody can be against you, because you got God on your side. The one who did not spare his own son, but offered him up as a sacrifice for all of us, will surely give us what things? All things. Along with his son, won't he? Who will accuse God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who's the one who condemns? It's Messiah Jesus who's interceding on our behalf. He's at the right hand of the Father. 
So if you feel condemned, that's not God doing that. It's the other guy. He died and more importantly has been raised and is seated at the right hand of God. Who will separate us from Messiah's love? Nothing. Can trouble, distress, persecution, hunger, nakedness, danger, or violent death do this? It can't. Paul's just saying this, this is impossible. It's not possible. For your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We're thought of as sheep headed for slaughter. But in all these things, we are triumphantly victorious due to the one who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor anything above, or anything below, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that's ours in union with Messiah Jesus, our Lord. We're more than, vic we're more than conquerors right now. Judah was too. They, were, they had a relationship with, with, the, with Yahweh. Messiah, as the angel of the Lord, came out and saved their bacon by taking care of the Assyrian army. Now, for us today, as we face the Assyrian army, and we have a Assyrian army that we're dealing with right now, to destroy us, our homes, our way of life, our worship, we need to remember this. The one on our side is greater. He's the God of the universe. He's conquered the grave. He's conquered Satan. He's at the right hand of the Father, and he has purchased us with his own blood and so that we could be with him forever. So why worry? You know, we shouldn't. For Judah, he rescued them from Egypt. He made them cross the Red Sea on dry land. He's the one that dealt with Jericho, not God. Not, not the people, God did. He is for Judah. So is Judah faithful? Not entirely so. Are there problems with their faith and with their loyalty to him? Yeah, there is. Are we completely loyal and, and faithful all the time? Yeah, we fail from time to time. But he says he's going to protect us from the enemy, and he does. And he does so, and he continues to do so. And because he did that for Israel and for Judah, we know that the promises he makes to us today and that he makes to us in his word and that he's made to the church, he will fulfill, literally. He will take care of us. What happens to the Assyria of Isaiah's, of Isaiah's time? They attacked Judah, showed up at Jerusalem, and were destroyed. Toast. As an empire, Assyria is doomed. The young men will become forced laborers. That, that's pointing to the fact that very, very soon, the entire nation is going to wind up being in servitude to someone else. What's the impact of finding 185,000 people dead among you? It says it right here, and this is a translation. Its rock-like army will run away in terror. Its officers will abandon their flag in panic. Off they go, back to Nineveh. They're done. By the way, in 612 B.C., Nineveh was so thoroughly destroyed, it never got rebuilt. This is about a less than 100 years in the future, it became a pile of sand that nobody could find until it was dug up in 1845. Today we know it's in the middle of Mosul, Iraq, but, in 18, but we didn't know that before. It is a prototype of the fall of all who oppose God and his plans, and it also points to the fall of the beast at a future point in time. The Assyria of Isaiah's time is going to fall in less than 100 years after being humbled. The Assyrians' destruction yet to come at the end of the age is going to be just as thorough and just as complete. And when we get to chapter 32 in two weeks, we'll see what that future looks like, and it's called the kingdom of God. But the Assyrian is already gone. I'm really ready to talk about something other than judgments coming. Isaiah does a lot of that. Because you decided to stay tuned, you've just been a part of the Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Do you know how glad it makes our hearts to know you're investing time in your relationship with Jesus? So much. In fact, would you connect with us and share a little about what's been happening in your life and how this radio ministry has affected you? The unsafebible.com has a space for you to do just that. Go to the Connect tab at the side and then click on the Connect card. Once there, fill out the form and then we'll be sure to touch base with you. Pastor Ken's message from Isaiah today left me reflecting on my own life and how I treat people. Do I treat them how I want to be treated? Do I give them the cold shoulder when I feel like it? Or 
Do I choose kindness over retaliation? Isaiah was one of the major prophets that confronted some of these common issues we still face today. You don't want to miss any of these teachings. Trust me. If you already have, don't sweat it. We have your bases covered. Just go to the unsafebible.com and click on Media. There you'll find this and other messages to listen to. If Go, Go, Go is your middle name and you can't seem to find a still moment, you can follow us via Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We'd also like to personally invite you to attend one of our services. Find all the information you need, including directions at our website. And just in case you've forgotten, it's the unsafebible.com. We hope to meet you soon. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. Come back again for more of the Unsafe Bible.